Okay, my name is Reagan Brummagen, and we're here with Bill Anderson. Bill Anderson, yeah. And um, it's May 29th, 2011, Glass Fest weekend. Uh -huh. And we're talking to Bill about his family and his own involvement in Glass. And welcome, Bill. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh -huh. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, biographical background, where you're born? And oh, myself, not yes, my, not my father. Yeah, I was born right here in Corning, New York, in uh, it's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> we don't bother about years. No problem. Uh huh. Born and raised at, on the Corning's north side. We lived way up on the. It was called Cutler Avenue. It's the last street up on the north side. And uh, it's really nothing too exciting. Went to the schools, to the north side schools. Had to walk, even when we were little kids. In those days, you had to walk. Didn't have no buses. <laughs> we walked down to, uh, it's still, uh, I can't say the, na the name of the street. You had to go down Dodge Avenue and down one more street. To, even to get into uh, to the lower grade, first through, that was your first grade through four on the one side, a big old building, and across the way was the, this is all the early North Side High School. And on the other side of the street was uh, was the original high school, which was was moved up to, uh, uh, up, up on, uh, you know, where the North Side High School, the old North Side High School are, is now it's called uh, North Blodgett. Side Blodgett. It's a middle school now, right? Yeah, middle school. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I graduated from, from, uh, from the Northside High School. Oh. We still get together with, uh, we have quite a few of the alumni, and we, we get together once a month. We call it the, the 44 Gang. <laughs> <laughs> that was our year. That was your year. Hmm. And we did, when we was kids, we did the usual thing, you know. Uh, of course, in, in, in the early days, there's no TV and anything like that, and no CDs and iPads and all the stuff that they got today to, to keep themselves busy. So we've made our own little games. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hide-and-seek thing, and where you'd go into the corner uh, where there was a street light, and uh, maybe somebody would take a, uh, a stone and knock out the light so <laughs> it would be <laughs> dark, and then we could play uh, hide-and-seek. <laughs> One guy would count, you know, up to 50 or whatever it is, and everybody else go hide and try to get in home free and all this stuff. That was one of the kind of games we played <laughs> through those days. And uh, they had a game they called Hopscotch. I don't see that anymore. If we have a sidewalk, you just mark it off and you, you jump on it. With... I played that, too. Have you, have you mm -hmm. played Hopscotch and you mm -hmm. picked up the stone? That's right. And put, yeah. Boy, that's been, <laughs> that's been a long time ago, too. I don't see that much anymore, either. Yeah. We played that when I was young. Then, of course, across the road, there was no homes at that time, and we had a, a little baseball diamond over there. Played, didn't play hardball. We played softball because none of us could afford a glove because <laughs> mm. he was born brought up in the Depression era, which came on in 1929, I think. Mm -hmm. So I was only four years old when that happened. But all through my life, we... We really couldn't have much. We had to make our toys. Dad was, of course, my dad was a gaffer in the glassworks, and nobody made much money in those days. That maybe they only worked two, three days a week. That you just could couldn't get work, you know. So there was no money for toys and stuff like that. I had to go for groceries, but uh, we made out fine. So tell me a little about your dad. You said he's a gaffer for not for. Ben for Corning Glass. Corning Glass, yeah. Well, uh, there used to be, if you've seen pictures of the factories before they put in the corporate headquarters there, they called it A, B, and C building. Well, my dad worked in a C building, and he, uh, he was the gaffer, which means he's the guy that blew the bulbs. He had a guy that would, uh, they called him a gatherer, you reach into the, well, you saw it a little bit of Rhode Sanctuary Square. Mm -hmm. they, they, they were doing a little bit like that, but that was more uh, fancy glass that they're doing, goblets and things like that. But these were bulbs and all sorts of things that they needed for normal day-to-day -day consumption. And Dad, would he made some kind of a, 
glass thing made out of white glass and uh, it was used in the uh, dentist dentistry business if you've ever seen any of the old dentist chairs you'll see a white tube thing like that that was just, I don't know what actually what they did with the thing I think it was just hole in it maybe maybe it had the water that you flushed your mouth out with or something I, I'm not sure but I never I never did know what they were but and then he'd uh, they'd uh, make uh, glass bulbs out of what they call ruby glass which is red bright red glass and they made those for uh, the railroad industry Okay. And the uh, the lanterns that they used to go like that, my dad didn't make those, but my uncle did. See, my uncle came, he came to Corning in 1914, and my dad was one of, in a family of nine kids. There was seven boys and two girls. And the, the boys, even when they were little kids, there was no, there was no uh, rules about how young a person could be to work, eight, eight uh, years old, they had to start working in this little factory. And to where go was to, this? In a, a little town called Hervik, Norway. It's even hard to say. <laughs> how do you spell that, Bill? H-O, actually the O is, it's uh, got a little mark on it. Oh, okay. And then it becomes like, uh, okay. Hervik. H with that O V I K. It was a little town, and all the it was like a factory town. They had these big barracks that, uh, that uh, workers lived in, and of course, no cars or anything to go anywhere in those days. If you're lucky, you could own a Model T, but <laughs> not, not, very few people did. Mm -hmm. So uh, they they work one day and they go to school one day. That was their life. So they worked a whole day, and then the next day... The next they day they went to school. Yeah, I don't know what the hours that they worked. Of course, a little kid could only work just so many hours, you know. <laughs> but uh, Dad always told us about that. that that's, he said, you boys, you don't know how lucky you got it, you know. <laughs> so he started also when he was eight? What's that now? He also started when he was oh, eight? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, what did uh, they do? What kind of job? Uh, it was in the, uh, they blew glass bulbs. They did? Yeah. And the, the, of course, at that time he wasn't the gaffer, but the the boys, what they did, there was a kind of a mold, and they were the mold holders. And um, the gatherer would would gather the glass, blow it a little bit, and give it to the gaffer, and then he would kind of swing it around and get it just the way he wanted. It, and he'd put it, so it's just a it's a long pipe with a hole with a tube, it's a hole in it, and then he put it down in this, it's like a an iron cast iron gadget, and then the boy would he'd put the glass down, then the boy would close it up. He was uh, the mold holder. Mm -hmm. And then Dad would blow the bulb until it got to where he wanted it. And of course, all this time it's cooling. And then it, it, when it cooled, well, then it formed the shape that, that that particular thing needed. And then the boy had to open up the mold, and then he'd pick it out. And Dad would hand it to what's called the crack off boy. This boy would put, put uh, he'd hold this iron, and then they would take uh, cold, just plain water, and score it. And there, there again, you could, I was watching these guys over here do the same thing. And they would score it, and then the other guy had heavy gloves. He'd hold the, the item that they were making and snap it, and then that bulb would be done. And this goes on all, you know, eight-hour shift. My goodness. Maybe that could make, uh, if it was a good day, make maybe 500 of them or something like that, if the glass was running good. But Did your dad ever talk about how much money he earned? In those days, he never said a word about it. Mm -hmm. When he started here, they were making maybe $20 a week or so. But, of course, in those days, you know, you could buy a pound of hammering for uh, 25 cents, things like that, and you could put a gallon of gas in your car for five gallons for a dollar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, accordingly, sure. everything goes up, and it's like now you're paying four dollars for a gallon of gas. That, that You'd have enough gas for all, for <laughs> probably two, three months. Yeah, right. That's right.
But things change, just like the groceries. We used to buy groceries when we when we first got married. Uh, a bag, we'd get three, four bags of groceries for ten dollars. But I was working for forty dollars a week mm -hmm. when I worked for the. I worked for an auto. It was called uh, Thompson Motor Company. It was a well. It's if you're familiar with Corning. Mm, a little bit. Yeah, you know where Pulteney Street is. Mm -hmm. At that, or yeah, Bridge Street and Pulteney Street intersect, mm -hmm. and then you take a half a block to the to the left, and on the other side. Right now, it's uh, it's a um, uh, it's, it's, it's sell tires and stuff there. It's called uh, I can't even say it. Capral. Oh, Capral mm -hmm. Tire. I've seen that. Yeah, and that used to be. Where I worked, it's when it was an auto agency. And I worked there for, I think, 35 years, almost my whole working life. From uh, about 47, I went there. I worked in a factory for about, during the war, uh, which was 40, for 1941 to 45. Mm -hmm. When I got old enough, I think I was a junior in high school, and they let us go work over in the factory after we got out of class, they let us work for four hours, a four hours shift from four to eight. Hmm. But, you know, they needed needed uh, as many people as they could. So many men were away. Yeah, well, the men was away fighting the, fighting the war. I was lucky. I was too young for that. So, mm -hmm. Although when I, when I graduated, I, I had just turned 18, and so I had to go and sign up for the draft. Mm -hmm. But still had about six months of the war to go. So I would have been in it, but two weeks later, that summer, I came down with polio. Oh, wow. I was sick in a, I was at Corning Hospital, laying flat on my back for about uh, three months, I'd say. And when I got home, and uh, they never called me. <laughs> this is, I probably would have been a very good, very good soldier, besides that of being small. They probably didn't bother with me, so I didn't have any. Didn't have to go to the army or anything like that. I was lucky there. But was your father? Did he go? When Dad came over here from Norway, that that little glass shop that I was telling you about it went out of business. No place for those guys to work. Mm. So my uncle Tommy came over in 1914, and he was also a gaffer. And he worked on on the big bulbs. Dad came over, he was younger. He came over in 1918, and the World War, First World War was still going on. So he got conscripted, in, but he couldn't talk, speak a word English. Oh my. So all they did, they didn't send him over to, over to Germany. He, uh, he, he, they sent him down to Baltimore, Maryland, and all he did was, uh, was a guard for munitions, a big munition dump down there. And so he was guarding all the all that sort of stuff, so people wouldn't come and blow it up. So that was what he did during the war. And then when the war got over with, why then he went? I forget. Then he worked here for a while. And his girlfriend, my mother, at that time was just a girlfriend. He went back over to Norway to get her, bring her here. And somewhere along and through there, they had a baby which was my older sister, <laughs> and then they came here to, to, to settle right in Corning because my uncle Tommy had found a place for Dad and his family to stay. So he had a place, uh, I think it was down on Watauga Avenue, that they lived there until, we, until he built the house that we, that we lived in, which was up on Cutler Avenue. So my whole life was, or up to when I got married, was, was right there in that little house. So how did they know to come to Corning to work? I then I really can't say. Somebody must have. Uncle Tommy must have found out from somebody that there was a glassworks in the United States. And of course, the only way they didn't have airplanes in those days. Not that would fly. It's just the beginning of that stuff. So they they went in ships. Mm -hmm. And so Uncle Tommy came over and ship. Then he, they. He must have found out that there was plenty of work here. So in 1918, when 
my dad got old enough. He was just 18 years old then. And he got old enough why he uh, set, for, set for him. He said, come over here. He said, a lot of work. So uh, that's the way that happened. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, had my brother and I, which there were three of us in the family, three kids, yeah. So did your brother also work in the factory yeah, with yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. fact, it was a, he was in a, a tragic accident. I don't know if you recall the old Vicor plant. I've heard of it. It used to be over just as you leave Corning where, where the uh, 352 goes out there now. Well, before that happened, there used to be a viaduct that came over to the north side. That's where the road went. Stopped right there. Well, there was this Vicor plant on, right on the west end of, in those days it was called Erie Avenue. Hmm. And uh, my brother was working in there, and they worked etching uh, glass with acid. And him and one other fellow, some, somehow this, you know, thing that the acid was being was stored in was broken, and the fumes came out. Mm. And him and this other fellow didn't realize it and inhaled those fumes and it killed them. Oh! Well, Danny was only thirty-seven years old oh, when my. that happened. It was a tragedy, and to this day, you know, I still think about it once in a while that here I am living. He's been gone all these years. There weren't many uh, safety regulations, I imagine. I don't think there was anything in those days, you know. Because I had worked in the main plant when I worked there, which was also, we, with, we did what they call frosting the glass. Uh, the glass, when it's blown, is clear just like this. Mm -hmm. And then the, it, these are put in a, there's a, like this big uh, container with holes in it. And these bulbs were put down in these holes. And then the guy that pulled a little cord like that, and then this white, it, was, it just looked just like frosting. And it went up in there. But that was what they call hydrofluoric acid. Oh. It was the most dangerous kind. You get a drop on, you're going to eat its way right to your bone. Ooh. Which happened to the guy that I worked for. I, I was looking at all of that, and I said, I don't want to do that. So I applied for a job like I told you, over in this, you know, this auto agency, and I was happy to get out of the corn and glass work. I mean, it was, it's a good place for normally for people to make a living, but uh, after I, I had my chance, so I, I wanted to be outside. I didn't want to be in a factory. Yeah. But I, I just don't care, never cared for it at all. I guess unless you're, you know, really passionate about glass, it's Probably pretty grueling to work in. A yeah, well, this, yeah. I really, because I never really got into it. We worked in what was called bulb inspection, and I was just kind of doing utility work there for about those two or three years. I think it was 1945 when I got out, or it was after the war was over with, and I had worked there for maybe two or three years. I think. They let us go in. I think I don't think I was even 18 when I when I started working. You could, I think you could work at 16. You got your working papers. Mm -hmm. So I think when I got 16, and I was probably a sophomore in high school then. And then when we got, like I say, when we got done work, we could go over and work four hours for the factory. But they sure needed all the all the. And there was a lot of women that worked there too in those days. Did your sister? Sister, she tried to, my sister wasn't too well. She had a bad knee, and uh, she tried to get into uh, the wax and the waves and things like that, but she got turned down. She wanted to be a nurse, mm -hmm. but she couldn't do it, so she kind of wrote out those things, <laughs> stayed right home. Mm -hmm. My brother's the same way. He had a, he had, a, a, he had a bad, he couldn't hear on one, same thing I got here. He had a ruptured eardrum, and they wouldn't take him in the, any of the service. So he went up to, uh, he quit high school in his third year, and he went up to Buffalo and work in, well, worked in an aircraft plant up there in, in the war effort. Hmm. It was called Larkin Aircraft. Oh, yeah. I've heard of it, actually. Uh, yeah. Up in Buffalo. Larkin is a pretty Larkin good Aircraft, yeah, or something like that. So, and I never knew what it was, but that's where he worked during the war, or the last two years of the war. And I'd get jump onto the 
railroad train. The old, uh, they call it DLW, Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. <laughs> and that was, if they had a, uh, it was coaches that you know, you'd get into it and ride in them. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to hop the freight or anything. And I, I remember it didn't cost much to ride to Buffalo. So I, I, we, I, I'd go up and see him, and we'd go roller skating and stuff like that. <laughs> the kids had things that kids do. A lot of fun. Was your dad still uh, working in the 40s? or? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, dad retired, I can't say just when, probably late 50s. I think late 50s, early 60s. I don't know just why. Because dad, dad lived to be 76 years old. That was 19. He lived through the flood. If you oh, remember the yeah, 72 flood, he lived through that. Back to what he did in that little home up on Cutler Avenue, he got out of the bed one morning and his, his water was right up in the level of the bed. So he went to the refrigerator and grabbed a quart of milk and a box of cookies and went upstairs. <laughs> Stayed there during the flood. Across the road there was two houses, Ambersone and somebody else. Their house was caught fire. And he said parts of those houses would burn and would float right past our house. And he was afraid it was going to stop and catch our house on fire. It was, of course, that's a whole, that's another whole story there. Well, tell me if you have. Yeah. I've, uh, I've got, I kept all the pictures of that, all uh, through, the, through the days as, as this was happening. I kept all the according leader. I still, I take them out every once in a while look at them. Uh, you know, apparently it was just. Scary and oh yeah, uh, no. The seventy-two flood was bad. Where were you? Up on Spencer Hill. <laughs> Spencer Hill. So you didn't. Yeah. Well, all of my wife's family lived down in the South Corning, down where the Corning Building Company is, mm -hmm. down in there. And I took my sister-in-law's house, just lifted it up, and put it back. There was a big tree back there. It had been for that tree. It would have washed it right down the river. And that saved it. Saved it, put it right back down on the, on the ground. And my brother-in-law was a carpenter, and he, he, we all said, what are we going to do? He got a hold of a chainsaw. He cut that house up into pieces that we could handle. <laughs> put pieces, <laughs> built it right, just like a jigsaw puzzle. Built that house back. Wow. Because we had to put a new floor on it. Mm -hmm. And I never seen it. Flood mud is the worst. The only thing I can tell you, I don't know if you ever smelled it or not. Mm. It's the most ungodly smell you can ever. Ugh. It's because there's everything in it. There's uh, decayed food from the from the uh, McDonald's came down through. And and the, the mud itself and all the worms and stuff that comes out of the ground. It is one of the worst things you got to experience. It's terrible. I hope it never happens again. Yeah. But we was lucky. It was up on Spencer Hill. And we, we were lucky because we had just filled our freezer up a little, little while before that. Of course, and then we, all of my wife's relatives, we had about 20 people to live in our little house. <laughs> and uh, we slept them all over the place. Because of warmth, you didn't have to worry about that. But uh, I'm trying to think of where I was next here. Yeah, they all, all slept in different rooms and everything, and then they all went back. We'd go down back down to down to Mary's house, and we were all helping put that together. And then I still had to go back because I worked at Thompson Motor Company, the Ford dealer over there, and we had to clean all of that up. How badly was that affected? Uh, the 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 place itself was okay; it didn't get destroyed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but everything inside, all, I ran the parts room, parts department, and all of that stuff was destroyed. So Ford Motor Company, well, I made up a list of everything they got destroyed, and they replaced every bit of it. Wow. Ford, Ford Motor Company did. Restocked all our shelves with new stuff. But I, you go in there and you have little things, little cupboards in there where the parts fit in. They were all full of water. <laughs> oh, Jeff. Yeah. Did that all have to be replaced too? The cabinetry yeah. and uh, yeah, we put new cabinets in. We tore all of that stuff out, and, and uh, it's probably a good thing in some way because then we got all brand new stuff. <laughs> but 
but I, I enjoyed working there. I, I, I liked the auto business mm -hmm. more than I did the glass business, mm -hmm. which I probably shouldn't say here because no, this no. is glass. <laughs> My goodness. It's, but, uh, you know, it sounds like a, to me, a very hard business to, to be in, you know, the long well, hours and... Oh, you mean the glass age? works? Yeah. Yeah. Well, back when, when I was working there, and uh, when I gra after I graduated, excuse me, graduated from high school, we, then we worked eight-hour shifts. You went in at six in the morning, and you worked till two in the afternoon, and then us young guys would say, well, will you guys do another shift? Oh, wow. We worked 16-hour days lots of times. Oh, my gosh. Working on... Uh, they had what they call a, a Norton, uh, it was a bomber, the bomb site. Norton bomb site was it called. Well, according to Glassworks, made that little lens. They polished that little lens. And we, we worked, we made thousands of those. Hmm. For all the airplanes and everything, they had this bomb site where the bomber deer got ready to drop his bomb. He didn't know, this thing would tell him how, when to release the bomb so it would hit the target. You'd have to release a bomb maybe uh, quite a ways before, before you was, if you released it on top of it, it would go way past the item, or the, the thing you wanted to destroy. So th that's about as much as I know about it, but, but we made the, uh, they made it, and they blew these glass scout things, and then they brought them up into our area, which was called bulb inspection, and then we'd have to polish them. What did you use for that? Uh, first, you, you use uh, carborundum, which is kind of a coarse, looks like sand, mm. black sand. And then we would do that, and we weren't good enough to do the finish. We had guys that could do this precision work, and they used what they call pumice. Mm. It was, that was white. And those guys would polish those things. So it had to be exactly a certain thickness. Oh. And they were kind of oval shaped mm -hmm. this way. It had to be just the right thing, and they'd sit there all day long making those things. This was all the war effort. So, Did you wear anything to prevent? Oh, yeah. You had to wear a mask all the time. Mm -hmm. If they ever set us down to work in the, what we call the blowing room, we'd have to work like, I remember one time they were making these glass coffee percolators. And they, when the, the thing got made, it was on this, like a, a belt goes round and round. And then you had uh, asbestos gloves way up to your elbow like this. Then you'd have to pick it up and put it on another one, and then on another stand, and then it would whirl around fast, cool it quick. It's what they call annealing. Mm -hmm. And they did that, I worked, but I hated it when I had to go out and do that. It was so hot, you worked 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. But you couldn't stand it. You're right next to these great big, uh, uh, well, there are hearts or these big furnaces. There would be holes all the way around it. And the guys were working all the way around this thing. There probably must have been gallons and gallons of this molten glass. It heats up to like 2,000 degrees. Oh, my gosh. If you ever stuck a finger in it, you'd lose it just that quick. So what did you, you worked 20 minutes, and then what did you do? You had to just wait. You had to go cool down. You'd sit under a fan for a about 20 minutes, drink, drink water, and, and, and eat salt pills. They, they made you eat salt pills. Oh. Put. Because uh, you were sweating so much. Sweat, you're you sweating eat. so much. After 20 minutes out of there, I mean, you, you were sopping wet. <laughs> Did anybody ever pass out? They might have. I never did, but mm -hmm. uh, it's something that probably could happen. I can imagine why you didn't want to work there. <laughs> no, I, I said that wasn't for me. I said no. I want to get out where I could I could be outside and work with uh, auto parts, and I'd take them to wherever they uh, needed them and show the guys how to install these things, things like that. It was it was quite a nice job. I I enjoyed doing that. Besides, I made more money. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, I imagine. But, you know, um, did you get the feeling that your dad enjoyed working in the glass, or was this a job for him? He, he was Just tell me that one more time. Did you get the feeling that your dad enjoyed working in the glass business? Or no, he hated it. He hated it. I think they all did, but that's where you had to make your money. And there was times that, during the Depression where 
there was no job at the Corning Glassworks. They were pretty much, they were, they were down to like one or two days a week. I remember that as a little boy. And there was a glass factory down in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, which made glass bulbs, just your regular light bulbs, just like that. Right. The same as that. They used to make them by hand. Then finally somebody invented a machine, a machine that makes these, and they blow them by the hundreds. And of course, then that was the end of that. Then the machine took over. And then they made Christmas ornaments. Didn't Christmas they? ornaments, yeah, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. But they, in the old days, you had to blow them. You'd gather the glass and blow it just to make one bulb. Hmm. So it was a slow process. Do but you they had you know, hundreds of guys doing it. And it's flat. And Cording has, of course, had glass plants all over the world. Right. Do you remember? Um, we just did an exhibit at the library on the pouring of the 200 inch disc. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you would have been a young. Boy, then. Uh, it was that, that was down in what was called a factory, mm -hmm. and we never nobody could go in there. Oh no! No way! Oh, that was uh, not even your dad. No, dad worked up in, in the sea factory. Sea okay. so he was a ball blower. Ball mm -hmm. blower. They called them gaffers. Mm -hmm. That's where they got this word, I guess, this gaffer thing. But no, there was, was a bunch of uh, guys that really knew what they were doing because that had to be filled just a certain way. And of course, the one cracked. If you've been over to the glass center, you've seen it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that one is on display right on Market Street for quite a while. I've seen pictures of it's, it. They made this thing that looked almost as a miniature to that, to that, uh, uh, I don't know, sometimes my words don't come. The, the observatory thing. It was right. kind of like round this dog. way and round this way, yeah. In fact, my wife's uh, father, he helped build that. Did he? Yeah. He was a carpenter. For, he worked oh. for Glassworks, too. He was a carpenter, and he built. And they, and with that thing, they put, left it right there in Centerway Square. It was there for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. Until the uh, museum opened. Yeah, until the museum. The museum went, that was somewhere in the 60s, I think. Museum, I'm not 51. sure just what. Yeah. Hmm. And... Uh, and then they, they brought it over there, and where it's just been there permanently ever since. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't been in to see it in a long time. But, yeah, I've seen so much glass, and, you know, that's just old hand to me. That's right. <laughs> so you didn't see the actual pouring of the disc? No, no, nobody, no, nobody was in one. Of just the people that had to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'd never done anything like that before. 200-inch disc. And, and somebody... They, uh, I don't know who, who it was that engineered the whole thing, but but uh, so they were just on the job training, even to the experts. Mm -hmm. And that, that had to be a nail to us. It couldn't do too fast, because then you'd get these breaks. I think they got a couple of breaks in, the, in that one, and that's why they had to start all over again. Mm -hmm. And it was it went from nineteen in the early thirties up into late forties before this thing finally got done. I think I think it was, and then when they get it all done, then they came out with all the stuff they got now. They I don't know if they even use it anymore. I think they do. They do, yeah. But but they've got so it's this new uh, way they've got now of sending things out into the satellites and like that. They, they just don't do this other stuff anymore. It's amazing. And they, you can see so much better. I can't think of the, you know what it is that the, the name of that periscope that. Uh, the Hubble? Hubble. Yeah, you mm -hmm. got it. My memory is leaving me. I'm getting old. <laughs> My memory's already gone. <laughs> no, I'm all like I can remember all of this stuff. <laughs> it's great. I think you remember things when you were young more than you do things that are happening right now. I've heard that before from yeah. other people. That's common. My short time memory now is not good. <laughs> but, of course, I was all done. I retired in... 1989, I had worked 35 years for the auto industry. And I didn't do nothing for about a year or so. At that time, they were building this highway that was going around the ground corner, this highway. And so I just go and watch that. I get bored with that. So finally, I said, oh, I want to work. <laughs> so you went back to work? I got a job at a place called Green Meadows. It's a adult retirement center. 
and all I had to do was drive their bus and drive these people to their doctor's appointments. <laughs> I did that for about another eight years, and here we are in 1998, and here I am, and I says, I don't want to work anymore, so I had told them, I said, no, I'm quitting. <laughs> so then we, we got, a tra got in the car and we started traveling. Oh, where'd you yeah. go? All over the United States. Mm -hmm. Two big trips. Took one in the early 90s, took us uh, the lower part of the states all the way to, uh, we didn't get to California, we got to Colorado. Then we turned back up through, or Arizona. Flagstaff, Arizona, and then we turned north, we went through Colorado, saw all the sites in there, and up through, uh, came out in Kansas, and came home that way. And then the next year, we took another trip up through the Dakotas, and Montana, and all of that stuff. So between those two, and then of course we've taken a lot of local trips, you can still do that. Mm -hmm. but, I got to get a better car now, so I could I could keep going. My car's wearing out. <laughs> well, you should know cars pretty well. Yeah, the biggest trouble right now they can't afford one. <laughs> right. The, gov the, the government don't give me much money, mm -hmm. and of course, working for the auto industry, I never build up any pension or anything. Oh, no? Nope, not a nickel. Hmm. Wow. I worked after my, my boss went out of business back somewhere back in the eighties, Jim Thompson. And here I am, I was 55 years old, out of a job. So a good friend of mine got me a job down in Elmira. And I worked there for another eight years, then I retired. So they didn't have a union? It wasn't a union? No, uh, no it's, uh, the garages it are independent. The, I see. If they want to give you some extra money, they can. The only thing we got, are, we got our annual bonuses and like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, no pension, no 401k and all this kind of stuff. That was just coming in when when I was getting done working. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when I worked out there, they had what they call a profit sharing plan. In that eight years I was there, I think I garnered over about twenty thousand dollars in profit sharing. Wow! And that's helping us now. The interest off to that. My wife is smart in in investing and. Still got one that's given about 10% uh, interest right now. That's which is, really good. Which is amazing for this day and age. No kidding. And so that's where we can get a little money to do what we want. With. Now, did she work? Pardon? Your wife, did she work? She's a uh, seamstress. Mm-hmm. Been a seamstress for, she makes these fancy drapes and like that. But there again, as we got older, her eyes are not good now. And and she can't climb the ladders to, to uh, put up. Tap tapestries and all of that, custom-made uh, painting and stuff like that. And she can do all of that stuff, but it's ages against us now. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly now we just enjoy. That's good, though. It's good to have some time to enjoy. Yeah. I hope I have a lot more years, but the only one that knows that is the guy upstairs. Right. <laughs> you just never know. Well, is there anything else you want to add, Bill? I would say I don't know of anything that I can think of that I think that pretty much tells the story pretty well. So interesting. <laughs> That's my life. <laughs> that was fascinating. Really great. I'm so glad you came in. Thanks for Well, you know, I did, I, I just read this little article here yesterday. And I said, geez, that maybe they might be interested in my dad. Definitely. So I just scribbled down this stuff it's just from memory and I thought, well, I'll go that far. That I, I kind of figured we'd talk it over, so. Yeah. But that's pretty much our story. Well, yeah. thank you. It was such a pleasure to meet you and...